Um, anxiety came up pretty high on the list of, of, of behavioral health disorders. And there are many, 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 many varieties of anxiety. Um, the ones, I, I jotted down the ones I think we, te we tend to get the most referrals for from schools. And the ones that tend to be perhaps most disruptive in the school setting, and they are, um, for the younger crowd, separation anxiety. Um, what's separation anxiety? <clears throat> Does not want to be without their parents. That's right. Um, it is extreme anxiety when se being separated from your primary caregiver. And so, um, you know, many preschoolers probably the first day or two have a little bit of distress or maybe even a lot of distress being separated from caregivers. But separation anxiety is something kind of above and beyond that. It tends to persist longer. It tends to be more distressing and result in more distressing and more disruptive behaviors as a result. Um, we see it a lot in the preschool setting, but that isn't the only uh, place it can come into play. I've worked with students in middle school who have severe separation anxiety, and it tends to be activated during transition times. So it was likely activated when they were in preschool, and then it slowly got better, and then it was activated again when they transitioned into kindergarten, and then it got slowly better. And then when they had to make the jump from elementary school to middle school, again, they, they often deal with it. I've, I've worked with students who it got activated again when they went to college, <laughs> you know, so you could see sort of the, the progression of that disorder over time. We also see students with panic disorder. Panic disorder, you know, panic, who knows what panic attacks are? Okay. Panic attacks are anxiety attacks, not just feeling nervous, not just feeling worried, but full-blown panic attacks where you feel like you're going to die. There, there are strong physiological symptoms, accelerated heartbeat, difficulty breathing, sometimes chest pain, numbness and tingling in, in extremities. Um, and people will literally feel like they're having heart attacks or they're having strokes and often present in emergency rooms thinking that they're in a medical crisis when really what's happening um, is a panic attack. And then, once you've had a panic attack, what happens? <laughs> yeah, you're scared to death of having another one. That was horrible. I don't want to have one of those again. So that actually feeds into panic disorder because then any little physiological change that you have makes you worried that you're about to have another panic attack. And so then what happens? Yeah, yeah so then you panic. So then, so, so literally, environmental changes. So I worked with a student one time who tended to have more panic attacks in the summer. Why? Less structure. Nope. Well, I mean, that's true too. Good job, you. But what else? But not for him. What else happens in the summer? It gets hot. What happens when you get hot? You sweat. Your heart rate goes up. Um, so what would happen is those physiological changes would actually be triggered by the weather. He would feel them. His brain would misinterpret them and think he had a panic attack coming on. And then he'd start to worry and he'd start to fret and it would throw him into a panic attack. So his panic attacks happened more during the summer. It's also common for people to avoid exercise for the same reason when they have panic disorder. Any questions about panic? Have you seen students who have panic attacks? Okay. Um, social anxiety is another big one. Um, somebody tell me what so I'm tired of talking. Somebody tell me what social anxiety is. Don't make me call on you. <clears throat> Just um, kind of somebody is always looking overly anxious, um, irritable. I'm afraid to communicate um, and excessively. Mm -hmm. and just a lot of times they, they won't go out. And right. They do go out, they just seem very irritable and um, just more so than, you know, somebody that feels nervous. Exactly. So, what is the underlying fear? Being around people. Okay. So, fear of being around people because of fear of being judged, right? So people who experience social anxiety disorder, the fear is they're going to think I'm stupid. I'm going to fall down. I'm going to make an idiot out of myself. Um, I'm going to be, they're going to say I'm dressed wrong. They're going to say I'm a loser. So when you talk to people with social anxiety, people who have trouble going to parties or speak, you know, the, the way that this really, really comes up is students who have a lot of difficulty presenting in front of classes or giving speeches 
or reading book reports, and they may actually have a panic attack, but the underlying trigger is that fear of judgment, that fear of social um, uh, criticism in that environment. And yes? Do they tend to also get in like abusive relationships dominating people a lot? Or? Well, I mean, I think it really is variable. The same thing you said earlier about with kids with ADHD, I think is true for people with anxiety disorder. Um, you certainly can see people who have social anxiety who become very sort of um, submissive um, because of that. And then the other thing that happens, of course, because of that fear of social judgment is often self-esteem is very much impacted. And so people with low self-esteem are particularly vulnerable to controlling relationships because of that. Um, there's another thing too, which is that people with social anxiety, um, their intelligence and their ability tends to be underestimated because they have a lot of difficulty showing what they know. As adults, they tend to be underemployed. So you'll have very bright people who've worked their entire life as night janitors, just so that they didn't have to have contact in their work with people because they were so anxious in those situations. Um, another one that can be really impairing in a school system is obsessive compulsive disorder. What's that? Doing the same task over and over. Okay, so repetitive behaviors, engaging in the same task over and over. Why? Why is that in a? Why is that in our anxiety disorder section? It's predictable. It's predictable. So if they don't do it, something else might happen. Right. Exactly. So what drives it? Um, obsessions and compulsions are dribble, driven by an underlying anxiety of something bad happening, and the ritual becomes that person's way of managing the anxiety. And so if you talk to most people, and even children, I have this fabulous kid I'm working with who has really significant OCD and more insight at nine <laughs> than most of the adults I work with. Um, most people with OCD realize that their fears are irrational and they realize that there's no logical connection between their ritual and the prevention of this bad thing, but they do it anyway. Because if they don't, their anxiety gets so large and so out of control, they can't deal. How is this going to impact? Do you know OCD students? Do you have OCD students, anyone? OK. How does this impact them in your, in your educational environment? They can't focus. Yeah. Right. Why? They're so worried about the, well, they're so anxious, and they're so involved in the OCD behavior. Right. They can't hear what's being presented. So, you know, when you see OCD in the movies, um, it's, it's very overt, right? So it's people washing their hands 75 times, or it's people counting um, steps, or it's people doing something like that. But a fair amount of OCD rituals actually take place in the head, and they're not visible. So what you'll see instead is a student who appears to be just zoned out because they're not really listening to you. They are instead repeating that prayer that they have to repeat 45 times because the random thought entered their mind that Jesus isn't real. And if they don't repeat that prayer in their head 45 times, something horrible will happen. So they're not there. They're not in the classroom right there, although their body is in the seat. There are typically, with all of these things that we're talking about under the anxiety, are there other anxiety disorders? I, I, I highlighted, tried to highlight the ones that I thought were probably most impairing and most, like I said, most frequently referred. What are some other anxiety disorders you might have encountered in a school setting? Hmm? Generalized. OK, what's that? Just anxious about everything. Yep, anxious just the worry work. <laughs> Worrying all the time about everything. What do you suppose we do clinically for students who worry all the time about everything? Yell, stop it. Yeah. Yeah, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think we could do? What if we assign worry time? Yes. I'd say relaxation, um, mm -hmm. exercise, um, find out what's, in, a lot of times, find out what it is, and maybe they might need some more psychological help, but what is it that? You're afraid of, and then try and identify that, and then, you know, it's kind of like a phobia where you try to work your way 
Right, and, for, and that, that's a good thing. And for anxiety disorders in general, we'll talk about that, but that's a lot of what we do. But for kids with a generalized anxiety disorder, it literally is sometimes everything. Like they will be worried about um, Ebola, the price of tea in China, the Yellowstone volcano erupting. They may be worrying about their cat who's been coughing. I mean, they worry about everything all the time. And when anxiety is that widespread and it's that big of a target, sometimes what you have to do is you have to find artificial ways to constrain it. So you can do things for, for, for some kids, as long as they have enough insight um, at their age to be able to do it, is assign worry time. So you have to start to limit the amount of time they allow themselves to worry. And so you might say, okay, worry time is from 6 to 7 o'clock at night when you're home in your room. You will confine your worries to that time, and here's how we'll do it. When you're in the classroom and you find yourself starting to worry about something, you're going to click that rubber band on your wrist or whatever the thought-stopping thought strategy is that we've come up with, and you're going to direct away from that thought and put it away till later. How easy do you suppose that is? Not at all easy right at first, but like every behavioral change that we're going to be talking about, it gets easier with time. We lay down different neural pathways as we practice these <laughs> strategies. And the reality is that for kids, they can practice these strategies enough to get better and better at them over time. And so then you have confined worries to a more manageable period of time. And then what can you do with them? Make the time shorter. Well, you can. But you also then have a reasonable period of time that's not interfering with school when you can start to do some of the cognitive challenging and cognitive restructuring that you might need to do. How likely is it really that, you know, your little brother will contact Ebola while, you know, at his 4-H camp? Um, let's, let's, let's talk about the likelihood of that event. Let's talk about the thoughts that you're having that make that seem like a certainty and how we can restructure those thoughts to be more realistic. Well, you know, nobody in our state yet has Ebola, and I live in a town population 95, and you know, none of those people have really been out of the state in the last 10 years, so the chances of them coming in contact with anybody, you know, this sort of thing. So we can help kids get better at cognitive restructuring. And that brings us to the fact that all, many mental health disorders, behavioral health disorders, but certainly all anxiety disorders have several components. And when we're educating kids and their parents about anxiety, it's important that they understand that there are three main ones that are impacting that child. There is a physiological component. So when people become anxious, their heart rate accelerates, they breathe faster, often they sweat, muscles get tense, those sort of things. So their body is preparing itself. Because if you remember that anxiety is really based on um, normal functioning of the body. You know, back in the day, saber-toothed tigers outside our cave, our body mobilizes itself to either fight or flee the situation, right? The problem with anxiety disorders comes when that response gets activated when there's not really an external threat. So we're activating it ourselves. Um, and so we have the same physiological reaction. There also tends to be a cognitive reaction. And a cognitive reaction is, if you were to listen in on the thoughts, and don't tell anybody from Monroe Meyer that I am talking about cognitions, because they don't believe in them there. Okay? Cognitions are non-visible, so we can't really talk about it, but I'm going to. Cognitions are the thoughts that we have when we're anxious or we're depressed. If we were to listen in on what that child is saying in their head, it would be something like this. Oh, my God, if I don't repeat this 45 times, my mom's going to die in her sleep tonight. I just know it is. I can't. Okay, I've got to do it for you. Oh, crap, I lost my place. I've got to do it again. So those are the cognitions that are taking place in like an OCD moment. Um, and is that reducing anxiety or is that driving anxiety up? It's driving it up. And this is common to all the anxiety disorders that the cognitions are anxiety provoking cognitions. The third component is behavioral. Whenever we're confronted with something that makes us anxious or distresses us, what do we do? We go away from it. We try to avoid it. So if you have someone who has a phobia of elevators and is convinced that if they ride an elevator, they will plummet to their death, what do they do? They take the stairs. And so what does that do to the anxiety about elevators? It increases it because it never is disproven. For 25 years, they take the stairs. And so that fear becomes more and more and more realistic because it's not disproven. 
So when we look at how to help kids with anxiety disorders, we have to address all of these components. So for those of you who are paraprofessionals or your school counselors or you have the ability to interact with students, we do. We teach them relaxation strategies to manage and get better control over the physiological symptoms. We teach them to identify and start to challenge those cognitions and have better control over those. And we try to support them and prevent them from avoiding the thing that they're anxious about so that the anxiety is not strengthened. So Janice preschoolers who have separation anxiety and have a big old meltdown and mom says, oh, I can't put my baby through this. I'm going to take him home. What happens? It doesn't help. It doesn't help. It's <laughs> twice as bad the next time yeah, and three times going. as bad the next time. And so that, those are the ways that we have to specifically work to help the students that we work with. Questions, thoughts? Um, is there any uh, research that you know of that talks about um, like when a child or, or an adult, any, any human being has gone through a really traumatic, very stressful, maybe near-death experience, that it has some um, re rewiring of the brain? Like it? Well, OK. Um, yes and no. Um, and I have, I, I've had occasion sometimes to work with kids who had been through, I guess, what would typically be classified as a mildly traumatic event. And where a clinician had literally told the family, he's never going to be the same, his brain has been totally rewired by this event. That's frustrating for me as a provider because it seems to suggest that there's nothing we can do to help that student, that that damage is permanent. So the yes part is that when, uh, when the human brain is under stress, it releases stress hormones and stress chemicals cortisol and other things. And these things can, over time, particularly over time, lead to some neurochemical changes, okay? So this is part of, we think, what happens with that kindling thing that we talked about earlier. So that when a brain is bathed in cortisol for a prolonged period of time, you're going to see more vulnerability to depression and anxiety in the future. The other thing that happens, I mean, what you're talking about, too, is sort of the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, or acute stress disorder uh, effect. So what happens with that is a little bit more complicated. But it's sort of um, where there wasn't an anxiety disorder before, one is created anew because of a certain traumatic situation. Um, and what that means is it's very complex and there are a variety of symptoms. But I don't know that I would say that the brain is rewired so much as that a set of symptoms are created because of the intensity of that moment that then have to be worked through and behaviors have to be retaught. Because what happens with PTSD is people avoid feared stimuli. <clears throat> this is an example. Um, 14 years ago, um, my first child was born with a genetic syndrome. She never left the NICU, she passed away. Um, while in the NICU, most traumatic experience of my life. When we would go visit her in the NICU, there was a certain soap that they used in the NICU. You'd have to go in and wash your hands before you could go in and visit your babies. Very distinctive smell, right? After that very traumatic event, probably six months later, I was working as an intern in a hospital that used the same soap. So I'm in the bathroom washing my hands, and it triggers that stress reaction, that anxiety reaction. What happened, though? What do you think happened over time? You mean after that, or what was happening with you during Over time, because we're talking about rewiring sorts of issues. What happened over time? You realized that, I mean, it, just time took care of that? Yeah, it wasn't so much a realizing, but what tends to happen is what's called exposure, right? And this is the primary treatment for really every anxiety disorder. So what happened is I couldn't really leave that internship. I had to be there, and I couldn't really go six months without washing my hands. So I was exposed over and over again, multiple times a day, to that triggering stimuli. It burned itself out, right? It, that exposure lessened the impact of that symptom over time. And that's, and that's what tends to happen. So I don't, I don't really subscribe to permanent rewiring sorts of, of um, suggestions so much as, again, long-term, what we see in the research is that long-term exposure to stressors neurochemically changes us. It makes us more vulnerable. It's not quite the same thing as a rewiring. And acute stress tends to create complex symptoms that can be then worked through.